today is we're going to introduce our very special guest. And then at the end, we'll have a few minutes for questions. And remember that the chat is always open for comments or anything that you would like to say throughout uh, Rory making his presentation. You can always comment in the, the chat section and I will be monitoring that. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Rory is recognized as a highly experienced and independent leader with an extensive experience in security and personal protection. Prior to establishing NSA Global Security Consultants as the CEO of Africa, Africa Operations, excuse me, Rory served as a Lieutenant Colonel in the South African Police Service, where he specialized in various fields of expertise, including investigations, intelligence, VIP protection, and bomb disposal. In 1996, Rory was appointed as a team leader of former President Mandela's personal protection team, looking after operations on both a national and international level. Rory is an internationally recognized security specialist, speaker, and commentator, and regularly presents papers at conferences around the world. And I would also, before we, like, before we get started, I would also like to thank our UDC member, Robin Reese, for actually presenting this idea and organizing Rory's presence here virtually all the way in East Texas. So I would like to thank <laughs> you for that. Um, they met while uh, Rory and um, when Robin and Terry, her husband, lived in South Africa, and he was a part of a protection team for Robin and Terry. And Rory also likes to mention that they are also brother and sister in Christ. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Robin and Rory take over. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you and Rory, thank you for being here. And everyone, we're going to try to go through these questions and answers quickly because we want to give you guys a time to ask Rory questions personally. So if you think we're going fast, that's the reason. Okay, to start off, Rory, tell us a little bit about your family. Certainly, and thank you, Robin, for this invitation. Good evening or good afternoon, actually, where you are um, in the United States to all of you, and thank you for your time. I understand many of you are giving up your lunch breaks to attend our meeting today, so that's great, and I appreciate that. So my family, that's quite easy. I have been married to my wife, Jill, for about, in December, it'll be 34 years. I think she's a school teacher. Actually, she's not. She's a little more than a school teacher. She's the headmistress of a prep school here. You guys would call it a junior school um, just down the road. And we have three boys. Our eldest, uh, Kyle, he will be 27 in January. And he's a professional rugby player in Scotland, in, in Glasgow. He plays for Glasgow Warriors. Our middle son, Ian, is about to graduate um, from the University of Pretoria with a commerce degree in a month or two. And our baby, who's 18, all 18 years old of that baby, is still in high school. <laughs> okay. Well, can you tell us what it was like growing up in South Africa under apartheid? I'll try, Robin. I'll do, I'll do my very best. So apartheid came into being um, in 1948, shortly after the war. Um, the much more moderate South African party lost the election. <laughs> there are quite a few echoes of your previous presidential election where people worked very hard in certain parts of the country, most notably the, the rural areas, and the national party snuck in and beat out um, Field Marshal Jan Smuts, who was after President Mandela in my view, the next most prominent um, and most extraordinary South African. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. He was a close confidant of Winston Churchill. In fact, it has been written that no other person was as much of a confidant and as, as highly trusted and regarded by Churchill as, as uh, Jan Smuts. And his party was beaten in this huge surprise election result and the nationalists came to power and they established the system um, of racial segregation known as apartheid. Let me just pause there and explain what apartheid means. So Afrikaans is a language derived from Dutch, and 
the, the last four letters of the word apartheid, so H-E-I-D, is a suffix. Much like in South Africa, you would say ness as a suffix, so goodness or kindness, or in this case, apartness. That is literally what apartheid means. It means apartness. And it was a set of laws. And some of them were the most iniquitous, iniquitous laws you can imagine. But basically, what those laws said was that black people were deprived of a vote and they were kind of forced to live in certain areas only. So they could not travel to the so-called white areas um, where all the jobs were and all the work was. And um, for that reason, it was an, an, an incredibly suppressive system or a, an incredibly suppressive law known as the Group Areas Act. So when I was born in 1963, to answer your question, Robin, apartheid was up and running. It had, it had had 15 years to establish itself since 1948. And we in our homes have these most wonderful African women, and you would have met a number of them, Robin, who are, um, some of them are semi-literate, some of them are not literate at all, but they work in our homes as domestic workers. They clean our homes. They are second mothers to our children, and we have had two of them. They were sisters. Um, Martha sadly died of HIV and AIDS as a buxom, bouncy, wonderful, friendly, smiling, 32-year-old um, uh, Tosa lady. And we as a family didn't know how to deal with that. That was way back in the late 90s or early 2000s. And we just, we were devastated. My boys were in tears because this was like a second mom to them. And then her sister, Esther, who had come up from their um, area where they, where they come from as a family, she'd come up to visit her sister in hospital. And we found out that she didn't have work. So we immediately employed her and she's still with us. She lives right here on our property, just next door to where I'm sitting. And we as a family have educated um, both of her children. But be that as it may, my point is that we have these wonderful women that serve in our homes and work for us as families. And very often their children also live on our properties. So I remember as a little boy of four or five years old, I would play with our domestic workers, little kids, until we got to the age of six. And then I went to that school and he went to that school. And, you know, when you're six years old, you don't ponder that kind of stuff. You don't ask why that is. You, I probably didn't even notice it, to be frank with all of you. And it was only much later in life that I figured out and came to learn that that was what the so-called policy of Bantu education was. So Bantu is in the, um, in the, the Nguni languages. It simply means people. So Bantu education was almost um, education for black people. And I benefited, I can promise you, I had the most wonderful government funded education. But my problem now looking back is that even then, White South Africans were only about 15% of the population. Now we are about 10% of the population only. So the vast majority of South Africans were excluded from that government education or they received a far inferior one. But as I said, you didn't ponder that. I just thought about it as, and accepted it as normal. And it was, of course, anything but normal. And um, we just grew up because the 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 ideology of apartheid, Robin, permeated every stratum of South African society. What do I mean by that? I mean that the media was controlled by it. Um, the South African Broadcasting Corporation was almost like a propaganda organ or a mouthpiece of the, of the National Party government. The history that we were taught in our schools was controlled by this ideology, and even the church defended it. The church defended apartheid. And I'm happy to say that um, once democracy came and in the Mandela era, the church publicly apologized for mm -hmm. having supported apartheid. But the point is our whole, um, our lives, uh, everything about us, the, you know, the, the, the culture that I grew up in was affected by this ideology and I thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. When you say the church apologized, I remember when I was there at Rosebank Union Church, the pastor got up and said, we as a church need to apologize for what we allow 
exactly. under apartheid as Christians. I was there when he heard that. So your earliest memory of racism was when you had a, one had to go to one school and one went to the other. That's what I heard. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And you're well, you're what, correct. And I, I, sorry, go ahead, Robin. Okay. Well, what is something you want us to know about how race has affected you? Well, race had a profound effect on me. My father was a journalist. And by the way, I was raised by a single parent, but it, it wasn't my mother. It was my father who raised um, the three of us. So you mm -hmm. can imagine that um, on a journalist's uh, salary, there wasn't a lot of, of money floating around in our, in our childhood, but we never, we never wanted for anything. Dad made sure that we were taken care of. But he was a journalist and he was then affected by what the media could and couldn't publish. And my dad, I have to say, he's no longer alive, but he would probably be described as, as old school. Took mm -hmm. him a while to move on and accept, you know, the new South Africa. But um, all, of the, all of those influences that I've, that, that I've tried to, des to describe led me, and I have to hold my hand up and admit this to you, it led me to believe that I, as a white South African, was, was better than and privileged uh, more privileged than any other South African of a, of, a, of, a, of a different skin color. So when I went to school, Robin, and I received this wonderful government education, there was not a, a darkly colored skin in my classroom or anywhere else in the school. It was a whites only school. And we stuck together as almost like as, a, as an enclave. So you can imagine 15% of the population and yet we had all the power. It was an extremely unbalanced um, environment that I, you know, that I grew up in. And, um, and, it, and, and it was all because of these race-based policies and laws known as apartheid. Okay, thank you. So what racial stereotypes do you believe people have about you? Well, that's a great question. So um, long before, and this is an interesting observation that I probably need to make, and I, I often try and explain this to, to all of my international friends, that when you speak about black South Africans and white South Africans, those are not two homogenous groups, far from it. So remember that white South Africans are comprised basically of, of English speaking um, households such as, such as ours. So our home language is English. And I went to an English speaking high school, so did all of my boys and my wife is the headmistress of an English speaking uh, junior school. And then you have the Afrikaners, as I say, they are mainly descended from Dutch and French Huguenots. In both those instances, the Dutch people that fled um, Holland to come to South Africa and the French people that fled, fled, fled France to come to South Africa, both were fleeing from religious persecution by the Catholic Church in Rome. And they wanted to come out and find somewhere where they could be Protestants and practice their religion um, in, you know, in, in, in peace and quiet. So the Afrikaner nation is distinct from the English speaking. And bear in mind, Robin, we fought two Boer wars. The Boers, the Afrikaners, fought against the British um, at, the, at the turn of the previous century, so from 1899 to 1902. And the British imprisoned Boer women and children in concentration camps. And the Boers, have, to this day, they have not forgotten that. So let me tell you this, that when an English-speaking high school plays against an Afrikaans-speaking high school on the rugby field, then for 18 minutes, you reenact the Boer War. And then you all shake hands and, you, and you're the best of mates after this. So even within white South Africa, we are not one people. And even more so, and you would know this, Robin, that within black South Africa, we've got nine distinct African tribes, mm -hmm. each with their own language, each with their own traditional cultural leadership structure. And they are not the same people. I mean, the Zulus under Shaka dominated every other African tribe, cleaned them out, um, in this, in the, in, in, in fact, quite a brutal um, campaign of war, and became the dominant tribe. And now that kind of jockeying for position within a new South Africa, where we have eleven official languages, still continues. So they are not homogenous groups. Everybody has his or her own identity, depending on their culture and their home language. Okay, great. Now we're going to pick it up because I want to have time for questions. Yes, ma'am.
Okay, you chose to become a police officer straight after high school. Can you tell us why? Yes, I can. Um, there are two reasons. The, the one reason was that, as I told you, my father didn't have the money to send me to university. And I probably did too much messing around at high school. And so I didn't earn the grades to earn a scholarship to go to, to college or to university. So I needed to study something. And I figured that if I joined the police force and studied law through one of our distance um, learning universities, then at least the police would pay for that. So they would reimburse me for year one and that would pay for year two. So I only had to scratch together the funding for the first year on the condition, of course, that I, that I, that I passed. And that is what I did. But apart from that, Robin, excuse me, in the early 1980s, when I graduated from high school, every white South African male had to do two years of compulsory military conscription. So you had to go to the army. You could get a deferment if you were going to university, but you only got that deferment for as long as it took you to get your degree. So if you then became a doctor or an engineer or an accountant, you still had to go and do your compulsory two years of military service. And of course, they would then deploy you in one of those professions that, you know, was applicable to your degree qualification. And I just didn't want to go to the army and get chased around by, um, you know, some corporal who's, um, uh, and, I, and I hope I don't, don't sound arrogant or facetious, but we always say, you know, his, his IQ is the same as his shoe size and he chases you around all over the parade ground. And I thought, no, 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 I'd rather go and, and, and join the police force as it was. Now it's the South African police service. And um, uh, the only catch to that, Robin, was that I would have to join for a minimum of four years, not two years. Um, mm -hmm. the, the pay was slightly higher, so there was that mm -hmm. additional bonus. And instead of staying on for four years as a police officer, I ended up staying almost 18 years, the last five of which I served um, President Mandela. Okay. Can you tell us about a little bit some of those uh, positions you held or promoted to, as we would know here, why you were an officer? Certainly. So um, I, you know, I started off like everybody else as a, as a police constable. And I then wrote my sergeant's exams and managed to pass them, I think, in the second year. And that gave me a promotion to sergeant. And then I did the same thing and wrote my warrant officer's exams, which is the highest non-commissioned um, rank. And if, you, and if you're paying attention, you'll notice that all of these ranks follow the British military ranking system because being a former British colony, everything about us had a British legacy to it. So our quartermaster's stores, our standing orders, even our ranks all followed the British military rule because, as I say, we were colonized by the Brits like you were. Um, mm -hmm. You fought a, a war of independence and we pretty much did that too. So the Boers fought two um, wars of independence against, against the British in the in the eight, late 1800s. Um, and then I wrote my, uh, my officer's exams and I was uh, fortunate enough to pass my officer's exams. And in 1987, I went on a three month officer's course, became a lieutenant and then a captain and then a major and then a lieutenant colonel. And that's when the opportunity arose to, to serve President Mandela. And um, it was the start of the best five years of my life, as you know. <laughs> Okay, now I know you've seen on TV about the murder of George Floyd. Could you comment yes. and also tell me what are the parallels there are, if any, to your experience with police and, and race issues in South Africa? Certainly, and those, and those are great questions. So the first thing I would say, and I, I did see my brother, um, uh, Officer Brown, on the, on the call, as much as a police officer sitting... 10 or 11,000 miles away can comment on a two minute video clip and make a judgment on it as much as, you know, as, as I can say that, um, clearly what those, what those, those police officers did to George, George Floyd was completely inappropriate, unacceptable and illegal and correctly should be charged for that. I, you know, I cannot see how one man could have been that much of a threat to that police officer when he was backed up by at least three of his colleagues. And especially when the man is crying out for breath, why would you keep your knee on his neck and risk um, further injury? And in this case, even, 
far worse than injury. The man died. Um, I then have to say that um, when I served as a, especially in, in the early years, Robin, so in the, in the early 80s in Johannesburg, that kind of practice would, would have been absolutely normal amongst, amongst police officers in South mm-hmm. Africa. I mean, it was, it was brutal. You know that a black person coming into a white area had to carry a pass that was signed by his or her employer to say that they had permission to enter a white area. So what we would do is at our police station, we had four different shifts, A, B, C, and D, and the station commander made it a competition on a monthly basis. The winner would receive two additional rest days that whichever shift made the most arrests would win those rest days. And the easiest way to make an arrest was just to go and ask every black person on the street for his or her pass. So if you caught somebody in that area, Without their pass, you arrested them. And they went to a a special court the following morning. So you detained them overnight in our police cells. And the next morning, they went to to court in a big truck, a big truck that, you know, you kind of locked everybody in the back of and off off they went um, to court. And the only offense was that they were in a white area. And in almost every instance, they were looking for work so that they could feed their families. So the apartheid system and ideology had an incredibly negative effect on families, on family life, because what you have, and we still have it today, is you would have the, the, the adults, so the mom and dad would hopefully get a, a pass and a permit and come into the big cities to look for work, and their children would be left at home in those homelands created under the, 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 the Group Areas Act, which was one of the apartheid laws, as I said. Um, with their parents. So it was the grandmothers and grandfathers who brought up the kids while the parents sought work and employment. And we were absolutely callous and brutal in the way that we handled black people found to be, and I do say this in parentheses, uh, illegally in white areas, because it was anything but illegal. It was illegal in terms of the apartheid legis- legislation. But all they wanted to do was find a job and feed their families so they would work and send the money home to granny so mm-hmm. that those children could be fed and go to school. And black South Africans of that generation, Robin, placed an enormous Um, premium on the education of their children because in many instances that was something that had been denied to them as I said under the um, the Bantu education program where the education that they received was first of all it was inferior and second of all it wasn't um, there wasn't enough of it and of a high enough quality to enable them to earn jobs and even if it was they couldn't apply for those jobs because there was another iniquitous law known as the job Reservations Act, which literally said that that job is reserved for a white person only. You can't even apply for the job as a black person. And it was, it became this ridiculous, Robin. Let's say you had a furniture manufacturing um, facility. Then a black person could take the raw lumber and feed it into this side of the machine. And it would either plane it or prepare it. And when it came out on the other side as a a finished product, it was now a product and therefore it had to be handled only by a white person. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But that was the kind of end result of this iniquitous law known as the Job Reservations Act. And all these people were trying to do, as I've said now, for the third time was feed their families. Okay. All right. Well, when you were promoted to serve as President Mandela, which everyone around the world calls him Madiba, and you can explain that, but as team leader of his protection detail, how would serving the president make a difference for you knowing your background with race at the time? That is such a good question. And and I think I'll answer the question first, and then I'll tell you why um, he was known as Madiba very affectionately. So as I said, great question, Robin. So I came, what you must remember is that I came not just from a a, a police background as a white cop, but I was also in the special branch. Now the special branch of the South African police force as it was in the 80s was that branch that concentrated on political crime. In other words, the, the almost like the foremost defenders of this iniquitous set of laws known as apartheid was the special branch. So any crime against the state was what we concentrated on. And 
I was the commander of the VIP unit in that special branch only once the the last white state president, the one who very bravely and courageously made the decision to release Mr. Mandela um, from prison and unban all of the political organizations that were banned organizations under apartheid. When he mm -hmm. signed that into law, we as the special branch had no more work because those people and organizations were no longer illegal. So they didn't know what to do with this very young wet behind the ears lieutenant stain and they said oh you go and start the vip protection unit because now that those laws had been abolished all of a sudden the national the nationalists those people that had been anathema to the diplomatic community and to the business community who wanted nothing to do with them were all of a sudden flavor of the month and they were traveling to Joburg, which is the big it's like new york city it's the commercial and financial hub of the country and all of a sudden they were coming and they were being courted by diplomats and big business and there was a need to establish a vip protection unit and they made me head that in 1990 and when i look back on it now robin i can see god's hand in that whole thing he was preparing me for a specific purpose but i didn't know it at the time so in 1990 i headed this vip protection unit and in 1994 on the day that president mandela became our president we were told uh, because we had to protect all of the very important uh, guests you know i'm talking about heads of state heads of government royalty and celebrities who came from all over the planet and i really do mean that they came from all over the world to south africa to witness this very historic inauguration of south africa's first democratically elected president and much more than that the most famous human being in the world at the time you know the the prisoner who became president and the freedom fighter who came out of jail and extended the hand of forgiveness rather than the fist of retribution you know and we were told because our job as the vip protection unit was to protect all of those international vips and get them from the five-star hotels which were all in johannesburg where i was the commander to pretoria 40 miles up the highway where this inauguration um, ceremony would take place that was the job of me and my team and i had never worked with president mandela before and we were told that he's going to attend a soccer match now who does that tell me who swears the oath of office as the first democratic president and then gets in a helicopter and flies those 40 miles south to Joburg and goes to Ellis Park Stadium where 60,000 soccer fans have been crammed into the, the stadium and the proceedings from the union buildings where he swore the oath of office before the chief justice were televised on the big screens there in the stadium and he was now flying in to greet the two teams because south africa as the hosts of this soccer match were playing the continent uh, the continental champions zambia so they were the current holders of the african cup of nations and they were our guests and the two teams are lined up now on the field as you you know as you do for when a president arrives the helicopter landed the protection team drove him around the corner up a vehicle ramp and into the stadium where i was waiting with the south african football association officials to receive this motorcade the president gets out of the car he is told by his by his hosts we need to go straight to the field the teams are, are waiting and he doesn't go therefore into the president's suite he gets into the elevator over there and goes down to the dressing room level and walks out onto the field of play where these sixty thousand soccer fans all all black have just watched him on the TV screens. They've just seen the celebration of freedom and democracy on the lawns of the union buildings where there are probably 120,000 people all celebrating this historic event. And they are going absolutely crazy in that stadium. And I'm asking myself the question as I walk onto the field behind the president and his entourage, I'm asking myself, hey, have you done enough? Have you got enough security arrangements in place here? As I said, I've never worked with him. I've never worked in a soccer environment. You know, have we got enough resources here? And the president shakes hands with the two teams. He walks off the field. Thank the Lord, nothing happened, Robin. He gets back into that elevator and he comes back outside the doors of the president's suite. Gets into the car. I take a step back and I literally and figuratively breathe a sigh of relief and nothing happens the car doesn't move 
and we see the president trying to get the door of this car open and we don't know why there are only a bunch of um security people standing and witnessing this because the football association officials have gone back in there to watch the second half and it's not an easy job when you're a 78 year old man just to flick your elbow and the door of this car opens because it's in a 3.8 ton armored car and the team leader gives the door a sharp tug and leans in and almost impatiently says to him mr president why do you want to get out he doesn't quite add you've only just got in but that's kind of the implication of his body language and the president doesn't say anything to the team leader so he gets out the way, president climbs back out of the car that he's just got into, walks around the hood of the vehicle and starts heading towards the vehicle ramp at the back of this reception hall that we're in. And the only person standing there is a police colonel in his full blue uniform with his stars and castles on his shoulder to show that his rank is colonel. And his eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the president is walking directly towards him and he's got no idea why. And the president stops in front of him and he puts out his hand and says to him, Colonel, I just want to tell you that today you have become our police. He said, I'm now the president of this country. But I want you to know that from today forward, there is no more you and us. You are now our police too. And Robin, this old warrior had the lines on his face to prove that he had kind of been there, seen it all in a long career. And he started to cry. And I remember the tears running down those lines on his face. And they were dripping onto this polished wooden floor of the reception hall. And the president just patted him on the shoulder and said, it's okay, Colonel. I just wanted you to hear that from me today. Then he turned on his heel, he went to the car and he said, take me to the chopper pad. And he flew back to Pretoria to host these 184 VIPs for lunch. And you know, folks, if you'd smacked me flat on the nose that day, I would have been less surprised than what I heard him say to my colleague. By the way, my rank was only, as I said, one rank lower because I was a lieutenant colonel. And I did not believe the stuff he said when he came out of prison four years earlier. And he told South Africa and the world that South Africa is for all her people, both black and white. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, whatever. Of course, you're going to say that. That's the party line. We were trained in the ideology of the president's party and I didn't believe a word of it. And four years later, on the day that he becomes our president, I hear him say this to my colleague. And it also said to me that those 184 big shot VIPs waiting there in Pretoria can just wait a further two minutes because that colonel needs to hear this from me today. So on the day that he became president, he started to enact the agenda which was the single agenda of his five years as our president. And that was this, build one South Africa, unite her people. And that is what he did. He called it nation building. And that was his single agenda. It was his daily purpose. And I watched him up close and personal do that. And he changed me very profoundly in the process. And the other thing it said um, to me was that Irrespective of time and circumstance, if there's a message of reconciliation to, to be communicated, then seize the moment. And I say that to all of you as much as I say it to me, don't overlook those, um, don't overlook those opportunities. Don't overlook um, any occasion that falls into your lap where you can speak about this in a positive way. As I've said, I'm holding my hand up and telling all of you tonight that I did not believe the stuff the president was saying. And he made a very Martin Luther King-esque speech when he went um, and made his first speech as a free man when he came out of prison. And he said, quoting from the Freedom Charter, that South Africa is for all her people, both black and white. And I didn't believe it. And four years later, I heard this exchange um, between him and my colleague and it completely took the wind out of my sails it knocked my feet out from under me and that was when I started to question all of this input and all of these influences in my life up until that stage I mean I, then I was a, a grown man of 33 um, years old I mean you can do the math I was born in 63 he became president in in 94 
So that would have made me 31 or 32 years old. Yeah. And um, how do you change 31 or 32 years of conditioning? Well, Nelson Mandela changed that in a matter of months because I started to watch him in this privileged position that I served him. I could watch him and I could listen to what he was saying. And he just belted out the single agenda of nation building, reconciliation, build one South Africa for all her people. And, um, you know, that is, that is what he achieved in the five years that he was uh, our, our president. And I, I miss him every day. So, Taylor, now I see that Robin has uh, kind of disappeared from our screen. So, um, uh, I don't know how you'd like to proceed. I can certainly just carry on, carry on talking, but I, I'm not also sure about how much time we have left. Uh, Roy, I'm still here. Just cause you oh, you're still there. Yeah, I'm okay, still good. here. But we are running kind of short on time for questions. But real quick, uh, yes, my last question is, how do you integrate your life lessons Keep those lessons going and the conversation going in your own household. Oh, Robin, such a great question. So Jill and I have made a point of teaching our three boys from when they were babes in, in her arms that um, all people are created in God's image. Amen. And therefore, every person deserves um, respect and dignity. And it doesn't even matter if you're from a different religion. It doesn't mean all Christians are created in God's image. All people are created in the image of God. And God says in his word that he wants every man or woman to be saved, not one to be lost. And you know, Robin, it was only when my brother, who studied as a pastor, and his uh, Brad is um, seven years younger than me. And when he was studying, he became exposed to black South Africans, something that I hadn't had the opportunity to to do as I've explained to you. And he brought a black guy that was studying um, to be a pastor with him. And I sat and prayed with this guy. And it was only after that prayer that the light kind of went on in my head. And I know that that was God speaking to me. And uh, what I realized then, Robin, and this is what we try to teach our boys, that if Jesus Christ died for that guy, that black dude who came and sat next to me and prayed with me together so that God would deal with some of the stuff I was struggling with and some of the messed up things that were still in my heart. If Jesus died for that guy, who am I to not accept him? If he is acceptable to Jesus' sacrifice, surely I don't have any right to exclude him or dismiss him or her or whatever. And that was the thing that got me over the line. That was the thing that got me over the line, Robin, that all people were acceptable to Jesus. Therefore, they have to be acceptable to me. And um, so we've taught, our, we've taught our children that. I have to tell you that um, I still try every single day to put into practice the lessons that I learned um, from Madiba. And I still haven't told you what Madiba means uh, from President Mandela, because yeah, I learned so much from him just by watching him and um, those are the things that are taught, uh, that we, Jill and I, taught to our boys. I am often asked um, to speak at things like graduation ceremonies at high schools or to speak to kids. And I, I grab every opportunity that I get to talk to the young generation of South Africans, because it's that important to me that we do not let our young people forget those lessons that he taught us, because we were well on our way to doing that a few years ago during what we refer to as the dark years, when we had a, a, a very corrupt president in office. And um, they were self-serving and they did not follow um, Madiba's example of serving the people and uh, delivering services to the poorest of South Africans. And I just find that to be the most vile practice where you've got poor people, which are the people, by the way, that vote you into power as an elected official, and yet you steal the money that is meant to provide them with housing and roads and schools for their kids and opportunities for work and all of that. I just find that um, uh, I don't have the words to tell you how much that disgusts me. So okay. it's important that I keep to the extent that I can, Robin, on, on the platform that I have, I want to make sure that our current generation remembers the lessons that President Mandela taught us. Okay, tell us real quick what Madiba is, and then I'm going to give it back to Taylor to ask questions or certainly, see if there's... certainly. So um, Madiba, uh, so President Mandela is uh, is a, he comes from the Tembu clan, and they are a Tosa-speaking clan from the Eastern Cape, 
And within that clan, the Madiba family line is the advisor to the king of the Tembu tribe. So when you say to him, Madiba, you are recognizing his role in society as an advisor to the king. So it's not a term of familiarity. People think it's a term of familiarity because it's a single name. It's like calling a person by their first name only. No, it's not. It's a term of respect because you're saying, I recognize you and your importance in that, in that culture and in that tribe because your line is an advisor to the king. So that's what Madiba means, yeah. Okay, thank you, Rory and Taylor. I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Rory, for joining us today. And thank you yes, for facilitating today. Do we have any questions? If you have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. We'll spend about the next 10 minutes just um, letting Rory answer any questions that you may have for him. And if you don't want to unmute yourself, you can always comment in the chat. We have someone that said, very informative. Thank you for presenting. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Taylor, so maybe what I should do is, um, is just ask uh, what is probably an, an unanswered question. So um, it, it, it probably would be a good thing for you as Americans to know that the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement resonated also in South Africa. And people often ask me as, a, as, a, as either a white South African or as a Christian, and it doesn't really matter in what capacity they ask me the question, but they ask, they ask the question, so what do you think of this whole movement of, of Black Lives Matter? And let me tell you what my response to that is. My response is that in South Africa, in the South Africa that I grew up in, Black lives did not matter. And therefore, it's important that we talk about this. So Nelson Mandela was the one that did it for me because I watched him. He convinced me that, yes, there can be a South Africa where we all live together and we can be one nation. And our rugby team has proved that th on three different occasions by winning the World Cup, uniting our country. And it's a conversation that we need to have. So in the absence of an, another question, and perhaps that was a question that somebody had in their heart or mind, I thought I would just, you know, do my, do my little bit to, 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 to answer it from my perspective. That's just my, my perspective. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Ladarian, I think you unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? I do. So thank you first and foremost for taking time out to do this for us today. Yes, sir. Um, with you being an individual that grew up in South Africa and being a part of the apartheid uh, time frame and the culture change that came at the time of President Mandela, uh, what similarities do you see um, in the South Africa during that time uh, of President Mandela uh, before and after him? What, what similarities do you see within South Africa and the United States? Oh, well, thank you very much, first of all, uh, Darian, for coming on today and, and also for your, for your question. And there are huge similarities because, and a, again, please, far be it from me, I, I'm, I, I'm not an American, so I, I, you know, I don't want to judge or, 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 or comment on, on your culture and your, and your country, but we do see a, and, and consume, as I've said, a lot of American media. And what I see, and it's so sad for me to see that, is I see this, this polarizing um, of, of, of Americans into, um, into almost two extreme positions along party lines, and therefore um, it becomes along racial lines. And that just resonates so profoundly with what South Africa was. You know, we had, um, we had uh, whites, uh, white South Africans that had all of the power and polarized everybody else, literally by telling them where they could live and where they could uh, go to school and um, uh, that they had to have a permit to come and seek work um, in, in, in so-called white areas. So I see a lot of, of similarities. Um, you know, I hope that doesn't continue in your country because I know that in the 60s, you guys also went through your own um, you know, you, you, you had the civil rights movement that led to uh, equal rights for all, just like when democracy came to South Africa in 94, um, we now have equal rights for all. And therefore, it is very sad 
when I see this polarization that is exactly the antithesis of everything that Nelson Mandela worked for. He didn't work for polarization. He worked for healing that polarization and um, building um, a, a national unity. And I, I, I pray that that might be the same for you guys. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. In, in talking about um, President Mandela and openly speaking and trying to, to bring the country together when there had been so much hate and division um, that had happened. And I think that's where, you know, a lot, a lot of everything needs to start from leadership. But how did you yes. see that? transpire in the community level when you have a president speaking about unity but you have this long history of division how did you see that play out at a community level neighbor to neighbor oh wow honey that's such a good question so i'll give you i'll give you there are so many examples i mean i i, I literally um please understand that i do get how privileged i was to have served in that capacity that I did because I got to see this firsthand. So I'll tell you one example. So our parliament, which is like your Congress or Senate is in Cape Town and it's, and it sits normally in the first half of the year. So the, um, uh, do you guys also have a state of the nation address when the president kind of ad addresses the nation at the beginning? Mm -hmm. So we have the same thing. So, and that state of the nation address is, is when the president opens parliament, normally in the first week of February um, each year. And because President Mandela lived in Johannesburg, so he did not like his predecessors and even his successors, he didn't live in the official presidential residence like your White House in Pretoria, because having been in, in prison for 27 years, he didn't want to live in the official residence. He wanted to live at home in Johannesburg with his four grandsons, and that's what he did. So we had to drive him those 40 miles north every day to get um, to his office in Pretoria. But when parliament was in session, he would fly down there early on a Monday morning on the official aircraft. And then our Cape Town team would take over the protection and they would take him. Then he did live in the official residence of Cape Town and he would go to parliament um, Monday to Friday. And then Friday he would fly back again and we would then pick him up again and take him home. And one week, instead of the parliamentary session ending at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever it normally did, it ended like at midday. And he flew up early. We got the call. He's coming in at 2 o'clock. Uh, we thought, great stuff. We're going to get an early afternoon here. We're going to get time to spend with our families, bit of a long weekend. And as that plane landed and um, I greeted him at the foot of the stairs of the aircraft, he said to me, uh, Rory, man, I want to go to Secunda. I said, Dada, why do you want to go to Secunda? He says, no, there's a young lady there. And he, by that, he meant a child um, who was suffering from a terminal disease. So there's this foundation in South Africa called Reach for a Dream Foundation, where kids that have terminal diseases can write to them and uh, express their, literally their, their last dying wish. And this young girl had said that she wanted um, to meet the president. So he says, we're going to go there. So now I am scrambling. I'm phoning resources. Nobody knows about this. I've got to now mobilize cops to go to that hospital and, um, you know, get stuff in place before we show up there 40 or 45 minutes later. And let me tell you that when Nelson Mandela walks into any public facility, whether it's a hospital or a shopping mall or a whatever, absolute pandemonium breaks out because of his sheer popularity. I mean, you can just imagine what I'm saying. You can think of what, whichever celebrity you can think of and it's times 10. So we go there. And once we get through all of the, all of the shenanigans and the nurses singing and dancing in the corridors and everybody wanting a piece of him, he goes into this ward and there's a, probably a, a 10 year old Afrikaner girl lying there with no hair on her head. She's undergoing chemo and she's literally dying. And he sits with her for half an hour and just talks to her one-on-one -on -one about her, you know, her life desires and her dreams and then proceeds to go from bed to bed to every child in that hospital and just give them some time. So once the word of that gets out, once that little white Afrikaner girl tells her family and they say, yeah, you know, I've heard that about him. And this one says, yeah, you know, my friend over there tells me this. For example, one of our um, 
sergeants who used to drive the official motor car in Pretoria. So he would be the one in our motorcade taking the president from that official residence to the parliament building on a daily basis. His wife had a baby. So one day we got back from parliament and the president told us we're going to see Marcus's baby. So yeah, we show up in this neighborhood. And again, bedlam ensues. And all the president wants to do is go into the house and see the child and make this guy feel like the most special person in the whole world. And then out we come. Now, of course, a whole crowd of people are gathered in the street outside and he sees there are children there. He goes straight to the children because he had this incredible affinity for children. He'll organize them into some form of a choir and he'll start not singing to them. He'll sing with them. What song do you know? And he'll, and he'll just sing, sing with the kids. So when you have a president that is that in tune with his people and who looks for opportunities to kind of just push aside for a few minutes the official agenda, you know, the formal presidential A to Z of that day, if you can just push that aside a bit and get onto the street and just talk to an ordinary group of South Africans, he will do it. And I have to tell you, Holly, that that in and of itself, and Ladarian will know what I'm talking about, that could be um, construed as a, a bit of a security risk. But I'm glad that I served the president that wanted to be with his people you know, that wanted to share in there, in the simple joy of, 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 of welcoming a new life into a family. You know, the, the guy happened to be, you know, part of our team and, and the driver of his official vehicle. But so what, what he was really celebrating was the birth of, a, of, a, of a, a new baby daughter. And as I say, I'm glad I served the president like that. I hope that answers your question, Holly. Yes, thank you. And so what I, I'm hearing you say too, for for us here in the community of Longview, even just taking time out to show people that you care, coming out of your comfort zone and building that relationship and connection. Yeah, you see, just because it was, that, that was so, absolutely, Holly, it was so important to him that we got over, you know, those awful differences caused by this iniquitous um, set of laws that had been there for, you know, for 40 years. Um, and it's so, it's so difficult to, to change because there was some real ingrained hurt that had been exerted by that system on, um, on, on, on in particular, black South Africans. And, and he was saying to them, guys, we've got to, you can't ever, you can't ever forget the past and forget what happened. But he said in a, you know, in a spirit of, 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 of reconciliation and of nation building and of coming together as a single nation, we've got to forgive and move past that stuff. And that is so, so difficult to do. And yet he, on every single possible occasion that he had, he would, he would reinforce that as, um, as possible. And, you know, he said, um, he's on record, you can Google it. He said, it is better to sit down and to talk to your enemy than to fight with him because you can, you, you know, you can, you can get over those differences. And even if the one doesn't convince the other, you can still get up and shake hands and move on. And that's what he did. So he eventually, as I said, the most famous political prisoner becomes president. Now he's got all the power that was denied him. That was the time to say, okay, it's our turn. Now we're going to sort you guys out. And he said, no, he said, come, he invited, the nationalists, the very national party that brought in those laws and that system called apartheid, he invited six of them into his cabinet and he gave the former state president a deputy president position. So he had two deputy presidents. You, you call them a vice president. So he didn't have one vice president. He had a second one because he wanted to give former state president de Klerk a position almost to recognize um, the bravery that it had taken for him to say, all right, I'm going to release this man and we're going to jointly negotiate a new future for South Africa. And I mean, it is, I can't even actually, Holly, imagine the extraordinary act of leadership and insight that all of that took, but yet he did it. And that's what makes him, in my view, the, the, you know, the, the, the most wonderful figure in the last, um, you know, of the last century. And uh, I miss him every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we're down to our last couple of minutes and you had a question in the chat, but I think you actually answered that 
um, in your last question that Holly asked. So uh, without further ado, we're getting ready to end this meeting, but I do have a couple of announcements. This is the start of Global Diversity Awareness Month. So I thank you for leading us into a wonderful month and celebrating that with us, Rory. And I will be Pleasure, out, Taylor. Thank you. I will be sending out some communication about the upcoming virtual events that we have and be reminded that our Unity Honors nominations close on November the 6th. And I will send out information about that too. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. We have our meetings every first Monday of the month. If I do not have your email address and you want me to have your email address, just go ahead and send me a private chat and I will add you to our list. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Roy. Pleasure, Ladaria, and you're welcome. Thank you, Robin, for inviting me. Yes. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Okay. Thank you.